Hey everybody, thank you for listening to Rant Burgers. This is the episode for Friday, the 11th of July, 2014. Thank you for listening. Um, this is my uh, umpteenth attempt to record this. I've been interrupted a lot. Okay. Um, I wanted to talk about, uh, first off, I have a number of things to talk about. It's going to be a fairly kind of randomized thing. Um, I wanted to talk about legal marijuana here in the state of Washington and here in Spokane. Uh, specifically, one guy, a guy named Mike Boyer, uh, on the 8th of July, was uh, the first guy filmed walking into a legal pot shop, buying some perfectly legal pot, and smoking it. Uh, cannabis, I think, would be a better term. Uh, He was uh, fired when he appeared in the media performing illegal activity. Uh, the headline today on MSNBC is that he's got his job back. Okay, I think that culturally the state of Washington is going to be struggling for the next uh, few years with the idea of legal cannabis. Cannabis prohibition is over here, but um, the attempt to demonize cannabis, the attempt to uh, make it unsavory and and feel wrong to people, the cultural effects of that are going to last for a little while. Um, the, Mike Boyer worked for an outfit called Labor Ready. Labor Ready is a temporary com is a temporary employment company here in town. What they do is they hook, uh, they hire employees, and then they rent out the labor of these employees on a temporary basis to companies around Spokane. It's a pretty basic thing. This happens all over the place. I worked for uh, temporary companies. I worked for temp agencies in Los Angeles in the early, in the late 80s before I moved here to Washington. And I've worked for one, uh, one of them, two of them here. I think I did a couple of days service for Labor Ready. But I also worked for an outfit called Humanix here in Spokane. Labor Ready uh, is uh, where you go if you're not hireable anywhere else. So they get a lot of ex-convicts. They get a lot of, of people who are recovering from other problems, for instance, addiction. And it's a kind of a rough place. And the impression I got the last time I went to apply there is that they're uh, not very welcoming. Uh, it, it, it really felt like kind of part of the system, the correction system, even though they're not, even though they're a free market, uh, well, free-ish market company here. Um, the, the impression I got was that they were much more interested in compliance and not having people freak out and break things than they were in welcoming a new employee and a new opportunity to make some money. So I'm not not a big fan of labor ready to begin with. So this guy Mike Boyer, he walks into the he walks into the uh, newly opened uh, cannabis store, buys some, smokes some on camera, all perfectly legal. Labor ready fires him. Well, today they're walking this back, saying that they had they were under the impression that he was actually supposed to be on duty and had ditched today's work to go buy and smoke cannabis, and that's why they fired him. And that once it was clarified that he was actually on an, uh, not scheduled to work that day, he he reworked his schedule to have the, the, the eighth off so he could go on the first day, and be one of the first you know legal customer for over the counter cannabis. Uh, they said, oh, oh, that's different. Well, I think really what they did was uh, it was about the uh, the negative press attention. And I think that's why Mr. Boyer got his job back. And I will bet $5 that he won't be working for Labor Ready in the month of August. Uh, I think that oh, there is my co-star, Angel the Cat. My first couple of attempts to record this, she was actually right here in my lap. But uh, time and tide, and cats don't understand multiple takes. So, do you, Angel? There you is. Cats are natural anarchists. Um, 
I think I also I understand from people who are knowledgeable on the topic that uh, the legal over-the-counter cannabis here in Spokane is going to be fiercely expensive. It's overly regulated already out the gate, and what that means is uh, the state of Washington has, uh, by overly regulating the cannabis market, has ensured that the cannabis black market will continue and may even thrive because I think possession, a certain uh, possession of cannabis, now I would be careful about this, about the amounts that are legal to walk around with. But I don't know what the penalties are for, uh, s for selling cannabis outside of their regulatory system. Uh, I, would, I would want to look that up before I before I walked around with any, uh, with the possibility of somebody perhaps making me an offer on my legally owned cannabis. Um, here's the thing. Um, back in the early 80s, I used up my, my, uh, privileges for smoking that substance. Uh, I am an alcoholic in recovery. I also consider myself a marijuana addict in recovery. For me, those two were basically the same thing, self-medicating my brain. And so, you know, um, I uh, if there's anything that's really uh, awkward in a conversation, it's if somebody finds out that you're in recovery, that you are uh, somebody who has a problem with that substance, with those substances, because the next thing you'll hear is uh, anybody, almost anybody, will start justifying why they aren't actually an alcoholic when they drink, or not actually addicted when they smoke up ad nauseum, forever. It's like, because I say I have a problem, people have to justify to me why they don't have a problem. I don't care. I really don't. If you smoke, if if you smoke a beer or drink or drink a bowl of cannabis, that's on you. That's your bag, man. I'm saying for me that I have an alcohol-related disability. That doesn't mean anything about you. It's not about you. So if if we meet and you talk about beer and I say, yeah, I don't drink beer anymore, that that's fine. Do, don't explain to me why you're not an alcoholic for the next hour. I don't care. Um, I am not the one in charge of diagnosing whether or not somebody is an alcoholic. And 9 out of 10 people, most people, the large majority of people. Now, a friend of mine described uh, his relationship to beer. He said uh, he, he uh, works in a country band. He plays in bars. Occasionally people buy him beer. Right then, I want to drop it and learn how to play an instrument. Okay, it's, it's my, that's my malfunction. But he said the first one is cool, the second one's eh. And by about halfway through the second one, he had to really kind of force himself to drink it. The third one, he takes a couple of sips and he leaves it there. And I'm all, eh, now that's some alcohol abuse. Damn. But you understand, that's how normal people react to alcohol. They drink a little bit, and then they're done. They they put it down. They're all man. That, that that's no fun anymore. Okay, and so that's you know how normal people do it. There are normal people. There are people who can drink in a way that's not broken. Okay, and they're the ones that beer is for. They're the ones that all that various kind of booze. They're the ones that stuff is for. Okay, it's like you know explaining how you're not really crippled when you discuss shoes with somebody in a wheelchair. You know that's fine. You know shoes are for people. Shoes are for such people. That's that's fine. That's the way that's supposed to work. All right. Um. On a side note, I also get people who are drunk apologize to me for being drunk in my taxi cab. Don't apologize for being drunk in a taxi cab. At least you're not drunk behind the wheel of your own car. 
you get drunk in a bar, you get in a taxi cab, you go home, and then you're drunk in your house. All of those are appropriate places to be drunk. The only time to the only time being drunk in a taxi cab is inappropriate is if you're throwing up in a taxi cab. Please don't do that. Okay. But if you're drunk and you're in a taxi cab, generally you're right where you need to be. Everything's working the way it should. Okay. I don't need to hear why you're not a drunk. And I don't need to hear th that uh, you usually don't get drunk in taxi cabs. That's okay. Okay. Just because you get drunk once or twice, just because you overindulge, doesn't mean you're an alcoholic either. Okay. Somebody who gets drunk every time might be a problem. Maybe. But I don't know. I don't know nothing about it. Because I had to make my own decision about whether or not I'm that kind of person. Okay. It's not my job to point at somebody else and say, hey, you're drunk. Okay. Um, so, yeah, I'm somebody who, for whom marijuana is a bad idea. Okay. Uh, that doesn't mean I don't pay attention to it as a liberty issue. Because for you, maybe marijuana is a good idea. Maybe it's an average idea. Maybe it's like eating a bag of Cheetos. I don't know not my job to say but when the state start think, starts to think it is in a position to have an opinion when the state thinks its job is to control then we all have that problem that's the state making that decision for all of us so we kind of want to pay attention to that okay so yeah right now the market in cannabis has uh, been broken by over regulation and taxing and so, uh, some people, I don't know who, may uh, carry around a little bit and be reasonable to making an exchange with their friends. <sighs> I don't know anything about it. Again, I'm, I'm out of it. So, yeah, I don't even know anybody I could refer anybody to. And I kind of like it that way. I'm, I'm okay with that. I'm okay with that. Which is weird for a cab driver. I'm supposed to have my finger on the pulse of things and be able to refer people to services legal and non that they might enjoy but um, yeah no I'm not really I'm not really good at hooking people up with the illegal cert with the unlawful services or services that might get them fired even though they are legal um, there uh, my next topic there are some people who are started out as part of the libertarian community I think they're in the act of talking themselves out of it the natural progression goes um, small government minarchist libertarian libertarian anarchist anarcho-capitalist and some people proceed through anarcho-capitalist to screw y'all I don't know what that, that that's called but that's what it comes out sounding like to me is screw everybody and screw everything and it's about a philosophy okay the anarcho the libertarianism through anarcho-capitalism the voluntarist zone is characterized by the non-aggression principle okay uh, the idea that my right to swing my fist stops at your nose okay uh, there are people who say that this is invalid philosophically it does not count because there's no objective standard there. Um, if you have a nose and my fist is in contact with your nose, that would seem to me to be pretty objective. Uh, but people who think like that would point at me and laugh for saying so. Okay. Um, I did spent the morning looking up on, on various uh, philo philosophical schools and what they mean and my big problem with uh, getting into a discussion with somebody who's off into the nihilism weeds or into the subjectivist weeds is that um, it would take a lot of work. You have to train for it. This is, you know, heavy lifting in terms of discussing philosophy. You have to train. Okay? Like, you know, you're not going to get into the ring on your first day against a heavyweight boxer and do anything but get punched and fall down. Okay? And I find myself in that metaphorical position all the time discussing any sort of philosophy with people. Okay? 
and I have a personal problem right now. I'm suffering from a chronic fatigue uh, issue. So I could read Nietzsche, but I wouldn't retain Nietzsche. Right now my brain is not in a place where I could do the uh, philosophical heavy, heavy training to be able to get into a ring with somebody who's been to philosophy class and, and you know, retained any of it and do anything but get punched and fall down. And that's my experience all the time. Okay. There have been people who are through the anarcho-capitalist into the screw y'all zone who hate the non-aggression principle. They actually call adherence in the non-aggression principle, I'm not making it up, nap fags. Well, my response to this is, screw you, then I'm a nap fag. Okay? I like it. And that's all you, that's, you know, that's all the philosophy I need to put into it. Um, but that's not a very good basis to explain to somebody who's still behind us in the minarchist or, you know, limited government or social justice zone, how they go from that idea into minarchism, through minarchism, into libertarianism, into voluntarianism, okay? But, um, it seems to be based on the idea of subjectivism, that everything is subjective, that there is no, that the only objective truths are scientific ones. Rocks exist, gravity exists, but you can't say that a moral absolute exists. You can't say that, uh, you know, it's always wrong to commit aggression. And uh, you'll get into semantic contents, into, into the semantic weeds, where defining what aggression is precisely. Okay? And you'll get into uh, the philosophical weeds, where is there an absolute... I tend to be a moral intuitionist here. My idea is that uh, human beings are tribal creatures. We are not built to live alone. We're built to live in a group, to have a certain amount of specialization and labor to help each other survive. Okay? I, I'm not saying that groups of people, that people shouldn't make teams, that people shouldn't make partnerships, that people shouldn't make groups to attack their problems with. What I'm saying is these should be voluntary. Okay? There should be no coercion involved. Um, but uh, some people uh, take, uh, in order to form these groups, uh, these voluntary groups of people who attack problems bigger than they are, I mean, that's a kind of a violent frame of mind, people who uh, band together into groups in order to more effectively cope with problems that are bigger than they are. Um, these people have certain emotional equipment to do that, and one of the pieces of emotional equipment is empathy. To empathize with somebody in your group to help you communicate with them, to help you negotiate with them, to help you find that partnership. Okay, So this goes down to uh, reciprocity, which is on Wikipedia as the golden rule. Okay. Some of these people who are out in the philosophical weeds will point and laugh at that and say that, you know, even though most people have empathy and most people have that sense of reciprocity and most people think that uh, the golden rule, do unto others as you would have them do unto you, most people would think that that's a pretty good rule of thumb. Even the phrase rule of thumb isn't that great. But um, as a general as a general practical principle, that's a pretty good one. These people who call us nat fags are pointing and laughing at us for for saying that. I'm saying, you know, just because there are blind people, that doesn't make color untrue. That doesn't mean color doesn't exist. It means some people are not equipped to see it. Okay, so. Empathy is a thing. Just because there are some people without empathy doesn't make empathy untrue. It means their empathy needs glasses or that they are not functioning properly. There are people who are sociopaths, who are psychopaths, who feel that, who, who don't feel any sense of empathy for their neighbors, who don't feel any empathy for other human beings. Uh, you know, those people are malfunctioning. They're not 
fully functional human beings in terms of this uh, in terms of this empathy we need to form our groups to cope with problems bigger than an individual okay um, there was a type of philosophy called solipsism that says you are the only person that exists okay um, I heard the term as a pejorative meaning somebody who who argues for the sake of argument somebody who argues to win the argument without any basis in morality or or fact or truth okay um, a good example of this is a lawyer in an adversarial system the lawyer takes as his base point your lawyer takes as his base point that you are right and then will make any argument at tw any twist of logic and any torturing of the facts in order to support that initial premise that you are correct that's his job okay so that kind of uh, of arguing is um, on if you are in a search for truth somebody who comes into an argument with that point of view is not being completely honest but if you're in a court of law somebody who uses that form of argumentation is doing what you're hiring him to do okay so context in that one is important so sometimes I feel when I'm in the ring with somebody who's done a lot of philosophical reading and they're punching me and I'm falling down, I feel like I'm arguing with somebody who's using that, uh, quote, solipsistic style of argumentation when that's not necessarily appropriate to the discussion. Um, but I don't know. Also, I haven't actually been able to confirm the use of solipsistic as somebody who argues for the sake of winning the argument as opposed to somebody who's on searching for the truth uh, so I don't know if I'm using that properly it was used that way pejoratively on me and I kept it and so that was my use of that term um, my theory with these people who get into the deep philosophical weeds and then go and punch newbies who haven't read haven't taken lots of philosophy or not philosophy minors or majors in college is uh, my thought is uh, screw them. I mean right down to the base right to, to get things right down to the basic point if you're gonna tell me the nap is wrong and then throw and then uh, you know throw a wall of text at me um, I'm not interested in playing that game that's no fun okay so if you're the type of person who says you don't still believe in the nap do you I've, I've had that done to me a couple of times uh, I, and you can see it uh, George Gian Coppolis's anarcho-capitalist uh, list on Facebook you know you can see people doing that and I find that type of discussion less than fun I do not engage with it because uh, as I said I would have to train up like uh, like uh, Muhammad Ali I'd have to train my brain like that my brain isn't all that capable and right now you know when I finish this I, I gotta go do some work related stuff I got stuff I gotta do I can't take my time to read you know all the collected works of Nietzsche and then Schopenhauer's and then you know everybody's interpretation of that I don't I don't have time to do that and so you can tell me I'm wrong and then I'm double wrong I'm wrong for believing a wrong thing and then not doing the research to support my belief in the wrong thing yeah, no, um, I, I'm going to go ahead and stand back and let you go fascinate somebody else. I'm out. Okay, so the last thing is, uh, right now as we speak, Israel is bombing Palestine. This is really sad and ugly. And again, it stems from the idea of Israelis and the idea of Palestinians as opposed to people. And uh, I don't see any way to make progress towards taking that away. I don't see any any way to undo that. Um, Scott Horton, uh, from the Scott Horton Show, formerly Anti-War Radio, is spent a, a lot of time on that topic, and it makes me really sad. But uh, I can't see anything I could do except to share with you the idea that, hey, you know, there's only people. This idea of of national or ethnic identity um, is at best 
like being a Star Trek fan. At worst, it's an excuse to hurt people. Okay, so I really hope that alert tone did not come across this recording. Um, I don't even know what was alerting. Oh well. Uh, I will figure that out here in about three more minutes. Uh, what else is going on? What else is going on? Some guy committed a horrible crime in Texas, but there's nothing really in a libertarian sense to talk to about that. Uh, Ukraine is having its civil war, and uh, I hope that it stays nice and uh, nice and compartmentalized. Um, here about here in last week, Vladimir Putin had hit, had the Russian Duma withdraw his authorization for use of military force in Ukraine. Okay. Don't think for a minute that Vladimir Putin isn't an amoral sociopath bent on maintaining his own his own political power. That means if killing his mom got him more political power or killed to keep what he had, he'd kill his mom. But he's a smart tyrant. And right now he's understanding that getting involved in Ukraine would be a quagmire and run the risk of broadening the war to other European powers. And so he's stepping back. That's just that's just strategic smartness in pursuit of an amoral goal. Uh, I kind of I, I note the smartness. I want to point out, hey, he did a smart thing, without saying that, it, without validating his goal at all. Because uh, you know, screw political power. To heck with that. Ah, bleh. So he's a smart tyrant doing smart tyrant things. Okay. Uh. Okay, nope. There's nothing else going on in the news that has anything to do with libertarian philosophy. There's fires. There's people drowning in rivers. There's crimes going on. And, you know, it's uh, it's bad when people die. It's bad when people die in a way that uh, is not just. But, uh, you know, there's no there's no libertarian point to be made with a kid who fell into the Spokane River. Spokane River can be kind of dangerous if you if you visit Spokane. Don't go swimming in the river. You know, kind of save it for a swimming pool because the river it kills a few people every year. Um, and this uh, this warning has been brought to you by uh, Jay for trying to figure out something to say on Rant Burgers. Okay, we're coming up to the end of the recording now. Thank you very much for listening. Be sure to give us a like, drop a comment, share us with your friends, and um, make sure to like some of the other people doing stuff here, because I have this delusion that I can be entertaining enough for you for 30 minutes on this thing. But other folks can probably use your support and could probably uh, use, your, use, your, uh, use your feedback. So uh, have fun, and we'll talk to you next week. Peace out.